Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So let's see how that so let's see how that goes. Okay, okay. Uh, so Simon Cox asked me to finish before nine. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, I'm. Um, I, I work for Microsoft for three weeks now, but this talk has nothing to do with Microsoft. In fact, that's why the slides say Northeast Regional East Science Center, uh, from the which is in one of the East Science Centers that Tony established in the UK, and uh, this is. Uh, part of what I was doing while I was, uh, I was there. And so, if any Newcastle people see me, hi. So, so Newcastle, uh, the, the, the Northeast Regional East Science Center is, as I said, is one of the East Science Centers that were established in the UK to promote the concepts of grid and East Science, and these are, these are the, main, the main centers. We had a, a lot of projects. This is a, just a representative list of the projects that uh, we have been in, involved in. Um, the, the, the projects uh, range from bioinformatics, from neuroinformatics, uh, from visual organizations and, uh, that deal all, uh, with the issues of security, of, uh, of authentication, anything to do with visual organizations, databases, distributed querying, um, lately the dynamic service deployment in a grid environment. Uh, we're building the Newcastle grid. It's actually up and running now. It's the largest in the UK. I don't know if Tony knows that. Uh, we have uh, 1,200 machines running on our campus uh, grid. And, um, and I'm going to talk about the Web Services Grid Application Framework, some work that we did, um, uh, we did while, while, while I was there. First, I'm going to talk to you about the grid. And I was very happy to hear what Marvin had to say because that meant that, that showed to me that we had similar ideas with Microsoft. So it's nice to be in an environment where we agree. So what is the grid? Well, if you ask different people, you'll get different answers. And here you can see uh, some of the answers. I, I particularly like uh, the Oracle one where you say, well, it's a database. Uh, if you ask Kindle, it says, well, if it makes money, you know, we, we, we are there. I like, I like also the answer, I, but I couldn't put it in, on, on a slide. So, uh, an answer that many academics, at least in Europe, I don't know if this is the case here in the US, that many academics give and they say, well, grid, it's a buzzword for me to get more funding, so, so, so why not? And do exactly the same things that I, that I was doing. Well, we decided, well, let's have our, our definition of the grid, and this is uh, what we came up with. We say that it's all about internet scale, service oriented, uh, distributed computing. So as Marvin said, it is distributed computing. Yes, we included uh, the internet scale aspects of it because we see visual organizations uh, also playing a role in, in, in grid computing. Marvin talked more, more about the, the intra-organization ones. Yep. And um, in 2003, when I moved to Newcastle, and uh, my, my boss then, Professor Paul Watson, asked me to get involved with the grid community, I, we realized, we analyzed, and we saw that the grid was promising all these great things, you know, how we build applications that can span organizations. People call it virtual organizations. Uh, how we do seamless integration between resources and, uh, and organizations, and how we do virtualization of, of the resources. At the same time, actually a few years back, at the, the, at the end of, uh, of, of the last uh, uh, millennium now, um, people started working on web services, and, and I'm sorry I have to talk about web services. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, topic of discussion in the most normal of situations. Uh, now 9 o'clock in the evening after a long day. But I hope you had enough to drink, so everything that I say is, is going to sound light. So web services, it's, it's, you know, it's all about glue. It's all about gluing uh, uh, the glue that sits between organizations, the way that we do integration. Um, 
It's based on standards, so it's all about standards-based distributed computing. And the idea is, you know, that through web services we, we achieve interoperability, we achieve composability of, of the quality of service that we want between, between organizations. Web services can be misused and mistreated. Uh, we, we think that web services uh, are best applied using the, serv the principles of service orientation. And if you allow me, I will spend a couple of uh, uh, few slides, I will, I will dedicate a few slides on, on service orientation and, what web se and, and how web services uh, start. If from my previous slide, you saw that there are some parallels, yeah? Great computing, web services. So service orientation is all about, you know, services and messages. We expose some piece of functionality on the network, and then we communicate with the services through uh, the exchange of messages. There I present, you know, three layers, but they don't really have to, uh, to be these layers. You know, you can have other layers as well, because uh, at some point the service has boundaries, the boundaries sit here, and what's, be, what's, uh, uh, what's beyond those boundaries, we don't really care. Uh, uh, we, only care we, we only care about the exchange of, of messages. This is just a typical uh, service. We, we, we build service-oriented systems by, ex as I said, by exposing some piece of functionality uh, as a service. And the, in a cluster situation, you can imagine you know, services like a job submission service where you send a job for execution or a registry service or, uh, uh, or a data access service and so on. And that's how we build a class. And this is what Marvin described earlier about how we built uh, HPC system, cluster uh, systems. However, the same principle, perhaps at a different granularity, can be applied in intra-organization scenarios where a service exposes the entire human resources uh, uh, facility of, of an organization or or the, the finance aspect of an organization, um, or the legal department of the organization. It exposes a service. We don't care about the implementation. We just know how to interact through communication, through the exchange of messages. And that's how we build our organization. Yeah. And then we, we can imagine that we can even go even further and abstract the same idea and start building virtual organizations, where different organizations come together in order to achieve, achieve a, com, a, a common goal. And, uh, and we do that, again, through the principles of service orientation. Now, one, one thing, if you, know, if you allow me to, uh, one, one observation that we made was that when we were building systems like that, and then if, if, especially if you read some of Pat Hillen's work, uh, uh, we, we talk about what goes, what we care, what what uh, goes between those organizations, about information that's being exchanged between the organization. We don't care about the actual resources that are being used, and, uh, and this is fundamental to, the, to what you're going to hear from now on. So we make a distinction between what we call resource orientation and service orientation. And we want to concentrate on, on what is uh, at, at the top. So, yeah, if you remember something from this talk, this is it. Service orientation is different from web services. Yeah? Web services is a particular piece of technology. Uh, we can use web services to build service-oriented systems, but service orientation is, is a set of principles, is, a set of, is an approach on how to build uh, uh, distributed systems. In fact, I could use CORBA if I wanted to in order to build uh, a service-oriented uh, system. Yeah? And this is a typical web service where we have the we have SOAP messages that are being exchanged, and then we exp expose some metadata through WSDL and perhaps some policy information. We have some implementation up there in BPL, Java, or .NET, and then we have the back-end resources that are logic accesses uh, uh, to, the, to the network. And through SOAP-based protocols, we can have all those different aspects that we need in a distributed system. You know, security, we can have management, federation, and, and, and so on. All the stuff that uh, Marvin talked about. Yeah? So with these basics, let, let me go to the Web Services Grid Application Framework. First, I'm going to give you some history. This is, this is, this is a fun part. So in 2003, um, there was the, re, uh, the first release of the, of a specification from the Global Grid Forum. It was called OGSI, which stood for Open Grid Services Infrastructure, and it was, it was supposed 
it was supposed to, uh, to be the underlying layer on top of which grid applications, grid services were going to be built. And then on top of those, grid applications. We studied the OGSI and we realized that uh, you know, we had some issues. So we wrote those in a, in a white paper, we, we call, which is now known as the WGS GAF paper. We sent it to some mailing list for, for, as a feedback to the work. And the result was, you know, good comments from prominent uh, computing scientists to uh, emails of frustrations, of frustration from other, from some others. Uh, the discussion, though, had started. As a result, OGSI uh, became WSRF. WSRF is another, is the web stands for Web Services Resource Framework, and it's uh, it's all about uh, exposing resources as web services, and this is what. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, now be, it's, it's now being used. WSRF solved many of the things that we identified as, uh, as problems with OGSI. We think we had a small role to play in that, and, uh, and, and others don't think so, but it doesn't matter. So the discussions can start it, and then uh, a certain uh, director of the UK science program uh, came to us and said, Look, you talk too much. Uh, what, 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 what do you do about it? You know, uh, you know, you don't have anything to show. So we got some some money for a year to to demonstrate the ideas, to actually build applications around around the web services idea. So thank you very much, Tony, for uh, for, for, for that. Um, and we decided to build two applications. Uh, we built uh, a, a commercial one based on uh, managing uh, chemical compounds that were moved in bottles and containers between different enterprises. We built the middleware for that. And then and a, a scientific application, which was astronomy-based. And I'm going to talk about the scientific application here. So, uh, because I don't want to bore you, these, these are some of the things that the WSCAF advocated in favor of, but we're not going to go for that. So the, the GAF applications... We wanted to demonstrate, uh, you know, what was a typical grid application. Um, and we used for that, so by we, I mean my, my very good friend and colleague, Jim Weber, who was based in, in Sydney. So we used .NET, uh, and especially the, be the beta versions of .NET, in order to develop these applications. Because we also liked, we were geeks, and we, we wanted to experiment with uh, what uh, Microsoft had to offer, the latest technologies. And we use web services uh, enhancements uh, for, uh, for, the SOAP, for the SOAP stuff. So, so here is the, the white goals application. So what I did, and this is, I think, part of the story as well, of, of, you know, part of the experience. So what I did was to, to send a message to Jim Gray and say, you know, can we meet? I have, I have this interesting uh, application that I would like to write. Can you give us some, some more ideas? Jim Gray, I met Jim Gray with Alex Alain in his office. He suggested that I go and talk to, to Bob Mann, who is an astronomer at the, at, in, in Edinburgh, and we decided on the application there. I wanted to build on top of what I already considered a typical grid application, which was the Sky Server, and, and, uh, and build something that would give value to astronomers. And Bob Mann suggested, well, well why not start looking for white dwarfs? So we have these databases, scientific archives, with observations of the, from the sky, and, and we wanted, or Bob Mann wanted, to automate the process uh, by which we search these archives for white dwarfs. Are there any astronomers here, by the way? Okay, okay. I haven't touched this for uh, about eight months, so please forgive me if I, I make any mistakes. And by the way, we haven't found any white dwarfs whatsoever. So plenty for you to find out there. So the idea is for the astronomer to sit in front of his workstation, or her workstation, use this application, which is a, a nice front end to, to what is available out on the internet, go to the HDSS uh, Sky Server. Actually, I think it, it goes first to the Super Cosmos Archive, because it has a, a larger coverage of the sky. Find, uh, apply an algorithm to find what, uh, what are considered potential white dwarfs. Then do a cross-reference. In fact, the cross-reference is done offline by the, by the archives. 
and go to the STS to the Sky server uh, to get more information, combine the information and go to the computational service to do the analysis, do image analysis, and so on, and then go to, to, to a visualization service to present, to present the results in a, nice, in a nice way. We didn't really do it like that, but the, the, the pieces, are, are, as, as I'm going to show you, are, are, are in place. So the idea is for the astron actually, instead of showing you the screenshots, <laughs> but as I said, no, what works? This, this is not very clever, is it? I can't see what I'm... Okay, so this is the interface. You can't see, so, so here, you can't see it, it's, it's, it's right, there is a, uh, a projection of the sky in, um, if I remember cor correct, ITOF projection. ITOF. So it's, uh, it's a projection, it's the 3D sphere, it's, pro it's projected in 2D. And, um, and uh, th these are coordinates. It's, it's, it's one of the mechanisms astronomers use to project uh, in, uh, in 2D, the, the 3D sphere. So the idea is that the astronomer can, uh, can choose you know, the level of detail they want, and the projection just uh, changes like that. Yeah, so you can see the coordinates, X and Y coordinates, actually it's longitude and latitude coordinates, and perhaps you can see some, some the, the lines here. On, on a computer screen, this, this actually shows pretty, pretty well. So the idea is now that you define the level of detail that you want, and then you say, well, I want to get this... Oh, I keep pressing the wrong... Sorry. Okay. And now I want to get the information uh, for the stars. So, so okay, so wh what it does, and this is one of the important things that we've learned, what we want is because this is a web service that goes and gets information, we want this interface to, to continue to, to function, yeah? So the menus work and all that. And this is all part of the experience of, you know, doing asynchronous calls, doing messaging, proper, properly messaging. And so what it does, it goes and collects information. Because we can't populate, we can't retrieve all the stars. Effectively, we will be getting all the information. What it does, it separates the, uh, the projection into these small uh, uh, spaces, regions, and it shows us, uh, it shows us uh, where, where, where we have information, which areas we have information. And the more, informa the more stars that are exist there, the, the brighter that, uh, that piece of the, that region is going to be. So what we can do is we can select this, and we can zoom in, and now you can see that uh, uh, we, are, we really went in, into that area, and we can uh, get um, in, information, more, more information. Again, this is another web service call, and it will, uh, it will give us uh, um, how many stars there are in, in, in that uh, region. At some point, there should be some stars there. <laughs> so I hope I've selected this. So yeah, probably that's why right. it's very difficult. You can't trust uh, satellites these days or uh, telescopes these days. <laughs> okay, so I may have selected the wrong area, and uh, oh, okay. I did select the, the wrong area, so... So I can select that area. I'm not going to retrieve the stars again because it's going to take us a while. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move... Let's say that we, we selected the area. This is the area that we want to analyze. So we go to the next screen and we get, we, we get the stars in that area. Now, this is an HR uh, diagram. Is that correct? Yeah, cool. Um, so what that display... Now, if I remember, this, is, this, is, this has to do with... Uh, 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 I don't remember, actually, but I think this is... These are the two... Uh, R and I, these are the two uh, uh, spectra in, in, in the... In the difference between two of the colors, or spectra, is the, I think they call it, uh, 
Uh, and I don't remember what eight star is. It, it is in a, a Russell diagram. Anyway, it, it is really meaningful to astronomers. And it's really useful to astronomers. I couldn't have said it better. So, so, <laughs> so, so it is really useful. And the idea is, the closer a star is to this area, more likely it is a white dwarf. So what, what Bowman wanted to do is for this tool to give him the ability to select which area he wanted to analyze uh, further. So, so you, you just change this and you say, this is, these are the stars that I want to analyze. And the idea was that these stars would be selected, all the information would go to the computational service, some image analysis would take place, and you would get the result. Now, it just happens, we didn't do that part, and the, the analysis that takes place now is so fast that we don't need to go to a computational service. We can actually do it on my laptop. So if I do the next step, just move next. Uh, did I select any stars? Okay, I select the stars. And, uh, sorry, I need to press analysis. And, and now these are more numbers that make sense to astronomers. And what you do is you can select one star and, you know, you, you, and hopefully something will appear here, uh, but it doesn't. So this is a live image from the SDSS archive. This is the actual photograph from that region of the, of the sky. Perhaps there wasn't one there. And this is you select one. Oh, sorry, I, ha I have lost my, I just lost my network connectivity. Anyway, so the idea is that you get a, an image directly that is, that is presented there of the area where that star is, but it won't show you anything. It's not, it's not that you can use it scientifically. It was just a nice touch. So, so that was the idea. And, um, and what we did also, so these are the screenshots, what we also decided to do was to take this, the same information, and do a visualization in 3D. So I was playing, while I was playing with Avalon, because I just wanted to play with Avalon, uh, Microsoft's new technology for 3D, uh, one of my MSC students was doing the same, again, using Visual C++ and OpenGL, and put it into a cave, into the cave. And you can see him here. You can't see he's wearing glasses, the 3D glasses. And the experience is just fantastic. You just fly into the galaxy with all the stars around you, and you can't see it here. You can see the different colors, but when you, once you wear the glasses, the experience is just fantastic. It's great. I had one of the SDS, uh, SDS the, the Sky Server developers uh, come to see this, and he was very impressed. He, he really liked it. So we were glad. And the WS -GAF, uh, uh, the WSCAF work lasted for a year. It allowed us to publish work, you know, get invited, and, uh, and uh, talk about this. We were really excited. We really liked it. And it was fun. And that was, uh, that was during 2004. In fact, I gave a talk, at the, uh, I think it was February 2005, and I said that was going to be my last time talking about the WS Gap. But then uh, Dan invited me to talk here, so I had to do it. Uh, anyway, because I want to, to finish with this, um, I'm going to talk to you. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to just uh, finish uh, with that. So what we learned from this experience and from our entire work on WSCAF was that we can use simple web services, simple infrastructure, existing uh, software to build grid applications. That was the idea. That's what we, what we were talking about in 2003. That what, that's what we did with our applications, and that, I think, is what the industry or the grid community is realizing now. And, in fact, there are discussions in ZDF, and they're seeing that the, the approach they took on, on defining their own infrastructure, when there was not an agreement in the industry about the specifications that they were using, uh, it was the, the, the wrong one. And now 
caused them, uh, I think now it's causing them uh, problems. And, uh, and of course, by applying the principles of service orientation, using web services in a, in, a, in a good way, it allows us to build rich applications that can help scientists do, do their work. And I think with that comment, I can, I can let you go on a difficult day and get some rest. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Oh, sorry. I, and I have to thank. Yeah. Now, drink. <laughs>